Evening Church, thank you for joining us for our Wednesday night Bible study. I want to ask you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 14 for our study tonight. Luke chapter 14, we're going to be reading verses 25 through 33 tonight. And the topic, as you can see, is nothing worth having is free. Now, I'm kind of one of those, if I see get something free, buy one, get one free, or hey, this is free, you can have it. I get excited and every now and then, yeah, there, there's a, a good deal in there some way or another, but I've learned this as I've gotten older that nothing comes for free. And if it is free, it's probably not worth having. And so in the book of Luke chapter 14, Jesus he is talking with the disciples and also a crowd of people. There were huge crowds that were following him. And he is trying to illustrate how the cost of following me, it's pretty great. You're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to work hard to be a disciple of mine. Because in the life of a Christian, even that, while salvation is a free gift, salvation comes with a price. It came with Jesus dying on the cross for us, but also there's a price that we pay in following Jesus. So again, nothing worth having is free. Whenever I was a teenager, there was this CD company called Columbia House. And you could sign up for Columbia House, and they had this awesome deal. Sign up and get 10 CDs free. At this time, I had just gotten a CD player. CDs were expensive. I didn't have a job at the time. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to afford any CDs, but this deal at the Columbia House, if I sign up, I get 10 free CDs. So I did. And I did. I got 10 free CDs in the mail. I thought this was awesome. But then I had a letter that came in the mail the next month that said, in order to be able to meet your agreement, you have to purchase two CDs over the next, I want to say it was like six months. And the cost of their CDs were like $30 a piece. And I was like, there's no way for a 14 year old kid, $30 might as well have been $30,000. I didn't have it. I wasn't working at that time. And my parents, they were not going to be very keen about me signing up for something that they didn't know about and then giving me $30 to pay for a CD. But I had to do it. So I took out odd jobs tried to earn money doing different things in order to pay for that two CD agreement that I signed up for. So even though I did get those 10 CDs, I still had to pay money for it because nothing worth having comes for free. So Jesus, he's talking to the disciples and this is what he says in Luke chapter 14 verses 25 through 33. He says, now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He goes on and he says in verse 28, for which of you, wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him saying, this man started to build something and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all of his possessions cannot be my disciple. When we first read this, this is a very confusing phrase to not only those that are with Jesus as his disciples, but the crowd. Jesus saw this huge crowd that was following him, this huge crowd. And he even said to his disciples, and he said to those, it costs a lot to follow me. Jesus knew that many of those that who were following him, they liked the idea of what he was saying, but they were not going to like the reality. We're seeing this today in this country. 
you know, for the last almost 300 years, we're, we're going on a little over 250 years that we've been in the nation. I don't, I don't know the exact number, maybe a little more, a little less. But this country has really not had to endure persecution for our faith. We haven't. Other parts of the world, since the birth of the church, Christians and believers, they have endured persecution. We here in America, we have not. And we're slowly starting to see a reality that's coming where to be a believer in this country will come with persecution. We're not there yet, but I do believe we're on that path. And so a lot of the faith that we're seeing in each other, we're realizing if it was true or if it was counterfeit, a lot of a lot of Christians have just slipped off the face of the earth during this season in their faith. You don't hear from them. They're not reaching out to other believers. They're not encouraging other believers. They're down and out. They're depressed. They're frustrated. They've not attended worship on campus. They're not even watching worship anymore on the internet or on TV. We're seeing that over and over, and we're seeing that their faith what it really is made up of. You know, there's an old saying to separate the men from the boys. You've probably heard that before. Jesus, during this season in America, he is separating true believers from those who are not. Or he is separating those who are strong in their faith from those who are weak in it. And he's using this illustration with his disciples and the people saying, hey, the cost is great to follow me. Church, there's a price for being a follower of Jesus. I'm a big movie fan. I've shared that many times, and I love the X-Men movies. This is a picture of a character from an X-Men movie. His name is Wolverine in the movie. His real name is Hugh Jackman. You've probably seen him in other different films before, but he's probably most famous for this character, Wolverine, in X-Men movies. Now, he is the longest running superhero character in film that's still going more than 20 years. He has been playing this character. He recently ended that character a few years ago, but this is what he talked about going into that last film and playing this character. He said, for more than 20 years, I've had to live my life around this character. Now, if you've learned anything about this character, if you've seen the movies, you have to be in shape. I have this picture here. I mean, look at him. He's buff. He's in shape. He's muscular. He's toned. He literally had to keep his body in shape for more than 20 years to play this character. He was almost 50 when the last movie came out just a couple of years ago. And he said the toll that staying in that good of shape to play the character of Wolverine, he said it came with a great cost. He said it hurt to stay in shape. He said it wasn't as easy as it was when I was in my late 20s, whenever I did this movie for the first time. I mean, this was what he had to do. Just a few things that he had to do to do the last movie that you see there on the far right. He's an old man, the way he looks in this time. But in order to do the last movie as Wolverine, at almost 50 years old, he was having to do every day 100 sets of clapping push-ups, starting at 4 a.m. He would then go into a very intense weightlifting session where he would have to bench more than 315 pounds, that's bench press, right? Then leg press more than 1,000 pounds. Did this every day. Some of you that are in your 40s and maybe even in your 50s, it's a lot harder to do the things that it was when you were younger. I'm in my mid-30s now and I'm learning, man, it's a lot harder to do things now than it was when I was in my 20s, especially my teens. And he said, just the cost of playing this character, it was so hard. He would have to eat literally every day, steam chicken, broccoli, cauliflower, no carbs. And he would eat, he said, about eight hours of the day. He had to constantly eat in order to do this. And so he said when he filmed the last movie as the Wolverine character, it was such a huge relief for him because of the cost that it took on his body. So again, church, nothing worth having is free. There's a cost. And to be a follower of Jesus, to be faithful in this season, and make no doubt about it, Jesus is calling you and I to be faithful. Not 
all of our days, but especially in the season that we're in. So the first thing that I want to share with you that I get from the verses that we've read from Luke chapter 14 is this. Salvation may seem free, but it will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. One of the things that I've heard about over the years is that people will, when they're trying to tell others about Jesus, they'll say, it's a free gift. It's a free gift. Now, while my salvation in Jesus, I didn't pay anything for it. There was a cost. There was a price that was paid. Jesus died on the cross so I can be a child of God. Jesus took my sins upon him as he took your sins upon him, and he died for that. There was a great cost in order for us to be able to be reconciled with God. And so he goes on, and he's talking about, hey, look, even though you didn't pay a price monetarily, to be saved, he said, to be my disciple, there's a cost. And in verse uh, 26, he gives some of the costs of what every saved person has to pay to be his disciple. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his mother and his father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So the very first thing that Jesus says that it's going to cost you to be a child of God is he says, you hate your family. Now we would read about this and we're like, this doesn't make any sense. Jesus says that we are to love him, to love our neighbor. So being a child of God means we're supposed to love our family. Ephesians 5 says that husbands are to love their wives as he loves the church. We're supposed to love one another. Now, you have to understand what Jesus is saying in the context of the message that he's trying to say. He's saying, look, don't hate anyone, but he's saying that you have to put me above anyone else. Jesus has to come first. And when he's using the illustration of hate, what he's saying is this. Your family can't be your idol. Your family cannot come before your relationship with him. You know, as a husband, I can't be a godly husband for my wife if I don't love Jesus more than her. I can't be a godly father if I don't love Jesus more than my children. I can't be a godly son or a brother if I do not love Jesus more than I love my parents or my siblings. He says, you have to be willing to say that what Jesus wants comes before anything that my family wants. My family and Lindsay's family, they would love for us to be able to live in Iuka, Mississippi or Florence, Alabama, to be nearby where they can see us daily. They can see our children every week, every few days. They would love those things. They would love to see us have a job where we're there from the time that we start to the time that we retire. They would love for us to be able to do more on the weekends with them. And we're not able to do those things because God has called us to ministry. God called me to ministry. God called Lindsay to be a minister's wife. God brought us together. And with that comes sacrifice. We had to say that our family comes second to Jesus. That means even if he moves us to the other side of the world, that means if he moves us hours away, if it means that we're not able to see them as much, if we're not able to live in the same place over the same amount of time that most people do whenever they start their career and then when they retire, it means that we have to sacrifice those things. To love Jesus means to follow him wherever he takes us. So for each and every one of us, where Jesus leads you to be obedient, that's a cost of following him, that you're going to trust him wherever you go and that you're willing to even tell your family, hey, this is where God's going. We're going to have to sacrifice our wants and our dreams in order to follow Jesus's plans for our life. Also in verse 26, uh, or excuse me, verse 27, he said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying ultimately this. He says that we, in order to be obedient to Jesus and to be a follower, 
follower of him, that we have to follow him in suffering. Being a believer means to suffer. Does that mean that we're all going to suffer physically? No, it doesn't mean that we're always going to. Jesus said that we're not above it. Peter said that we're not above to suffer physically. And again, for the first 300 years in the life of the church, after Jesus went into heaven, the church was persecuted by Rome. Rome didn't even recognize the church as a good faith until more than 300 years later. Even then, the church was persecuted. The church has been persecuted ever since. It's persecuted all over the world. My wife, whenever she was in China, in order to go to the international church, which a Chinese national could not go to, in order to get into that church, you had to show your passport. Because if you were a Chinese citizen, you couldn't go. Because they did not allow their citizens to be able to participate in a lot of the things that the church is supposed to be able to do and be a part of. In some countries, in order to be a child of God means that you're going to forfeit your life, that you're going to admit that you're willing to be killed for your faith, and you're willing to sacrifice that. There's a consequence that comes. Suffering that we may endure is that we lose friendships, that we may lose our jobs, that we may lose relationships, we may lose out on physical things. People may try to take from us things that are ours, because we're followers of Jesus. He said, there's the cost of following me and that suffering is a part of it. Church, in this season, you have to learn the lesson that what we have, it doesn't mean anything in the kingdom of God. And by what we have, I'm talking about physically, that we have to be willing to sacrifice those things in order to follow Jesus. Our own lives, our health, our possessions, our time, relationships. Those are things that Jesus say, hey, this is a cost that you have to be willing to pay in order to follow me. And then he goes on and he says in verse 28, for which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Jesus says that you have to be willing to count the cost. He says you have to sit down. One of the things that um, pastors told me, that my pastor told me whenever I was dealing with a call to ministry, whenever I was 19 years old and I was just unsure about what God was calling me to do, I thought that he was calling me to ministry and I was talking about it with my pastor and he said, Shandy, he said, you have to calculate the cost. He said, this is going to change your life completely from top to bottom. You have to realize that what you're going to do is going to be different. You're not going to live the same way that other people live. The expectations and the requirements that God is going to have for you, it's going to be greater and it's going to be different from those that are not called to ministry. And that does not mean, I want to say, that God does not call everyone to a higher standard. He does. But for those in ministry, there's even a higher calling. And he said, it's going to be costly. I had another pastor one time tell me, he said, if you can do anything else but be a minister, do it. And what he was trying to say is, if you're wanting to know if it's God's will for you, try to do everything else but that. And if you can't, then you know you've truly been called. Well, for all of us who are followers of Jesus, regardless of if we're ministers or not, man, Jesus said, hey, you have to count the cost. You have to be willing to look and say, hey, I know that it's going to cost me this, but it's worth the cost. And church, let me tell you, following Jesus is always worth the cost. You know, um, whenever we're wanting to get in shape or if we're wanting to diet and exercise or if we're wanting to build up savings, none of those things are ever easy. It, it takes a lot of sacrifice to build up a savings account. It takes a lot of sacrifice in order to get in shape and to lose weight or whatever. I remember when I was in high school, me and a group of guys, we wanted to get in shape going into our senior year of sports. And we would go and we would meet at the track four days a week and we would run. And I remember how hard it was when we started and how we had to push each other when we didn't want to run. The other would hold us accountable and say, you're running today. When we wanted to quit, after the third or fourth or fifth and the more laps we would do, they would say, you've got to keep pushing yourself because we wanted to be greater. 
But whenever we would realize that we were getting stronger and we were getting better at what we were trying to do, we realized the sacrifice is worth every bit of the cost. To close this out, Paul talks about it in the book of Philippians chapter 4 in verse 11. And he says, essentially, this, this is what I believe Paul is saying in Philippians 4. When we do things we have never done, we will gain things that we've never had. When you're willing to do something that you've never done in your faith, when you're wanting to step out and you're willing to sacrifice and you're willing to serve and you're willing to give and you're willing to give more of yourself and more of your time, more of your energy, and you're willing to put aside things in your life that are keeping you from Jesus, cutting out sin in your life, cutting out earthly things in your life, when you're willing to do those things, you will be able to experience things that you've never experienced. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, he said, I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself. Paul is saying that in the good, the bad, the high, the low, everything that I've ever done before Jesus, he said, since then, in the things that I've been willing to do, the things that I have sacrificed, the things that I have lost, that I've given up, he said, it's worth every bit. He said, because I'm content. I'm content. To be content means to be happy, to be at peace, to not be in uh, doubt, to not be in want, to be satisfied where you are. And Paul said, I'm satisfied in Jesus. Church, listen, if you've been holding on to things that you know Jesus is saying, you've got to let it go. You have to give it up. If you're willing to do that, Paul said, you'll be content because you're going to find a peace that's greater than anything you've ever felt. You're going to find joy and contentment in things that you never would have otherwise. The greatest view comes after the hardest climb. So during the season and moving forward, it's okay. It's okay if it hurts. But what's important, church, is that you're willing to do what it takes, that you're willing to sacrifice, you're willing to lay this aside, lay, lay dreams aside, goals aside, vices aside, sins aside, to say, Jesus, I want more of you, so here's more of me. And so Jesus is telling the disciples this, because in the end, church, in the end, it's this whole thing, nothing worth having is free. The cost that comes with being a follower of God is worth everything. The cost that we uh, give, the sacrifices we make in order to be a follower of Jesus, it's worth everything. It's worth more than we could ever imagine. So I want to challenge you to grow, be willing to give and to sacrifice and just to trust God because following Jesus is worth everything everything. I want to lead us in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, God, as we close this out this evening, I thank you for just your word and just the power of it, the truth of it. God, I want to thank you that when we give things up for you, that God, we gain more in return. Lord, I just pray that if there are things in our lives that maybe that we have been holding on to, that we haven't uh, just wanted to put aside, that God, you would give us the strength and the courage to do it. And God, that we would see the benefits of what it means to be willing to sacrifice things in this life in order to gain more of you. God, you are worth everything. God, you gave up everything so that we might know you. So God, may we give you our life and that we would follow you. I thank you for the people that are watching tonight. Lord, I pray you would watch over them. Just keep them healthy, Lord. Keep them safe. But God, I pray that you would equip them, that you would call them, that you would empower them, and that God, you would open doors. We thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to serve you in this season. We say this in your name. Amen. Church, we love you. Have a great evening, a great rest of the week, and we'll see you again soon.